good and bad, young and old. The things we're fighting will destroy them all alike. You can still help a lot more than you've harmed Clegane. It's not too late for you. Twelve seconds later. <laughs> Hello Macabros and thank you for tuning in today for episode 9 of Game of Thrones Rewrite. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss an episode, consider supporting me on Patreon, and sit back and relax as our subject today will be fan favorite, the Mad Dog himself, Sandor Clegane, aka The Hound. Now this video will be slightly different than the previous episodes in this rewrite series, as there won't be all that much rewriting for the majority of Sandor's arc, as I felt it was done magnificently throughout the first four seasons of the show, with Rory McCann doing an absolutely stellar job at humanizing a man whom we were originally meant to only see as a feral beast. And unlike most of the other characters whom we've discussed so far, I actually felt Sandor's arc through season 6 and 7 was pretty solid as well, with Sandor seeking redemption following his near-death experience at the end of season 4. Sandor is told that there may be a greater purpose to him being alive, and his arc from then on out is focused on him seeking out what that greater purpose may be, even if Sandor himself has doubts that there is one. There are a few hiccups throughout his arc that I will go over, but they are few and far between. Shit, there's even redeeming material within Season 8 that is actually consistent with his character progression throughout the entire series. But then there's... Yeah, that's you. Uh... While regarding the subjects of our previous episodes, you could technically find reasons and justifications as to why the arcs of each character took a tumble. In some cases, it was due to changes made far earlier in the series that resulted in a character's arc trajectory losing its direction. In others, it was inserting insanely contrived character decisions in order to attain a desired outcome. Now, Sandor's arc does not fall into Category 1 because, as I mentioned, his arc all the way up to the final season, and even throughout a portion of the final season, was solid. Now, it is possible that Sandor would fall into Category 2, along with the likes of Jamie and Danny, with his decision to travel to King's Landing to face off against his elder brother being the contrived choice that leads the Clegane the writer's desired outcome. The reason I believe that the assassination of Sandor Clegane by the limp dick shit heels David Benioff and D.B. Weiss does not fall into this category is that in the case of, say, Danny and Jamie, I at least sort of understand what they were trying to do. In Danny's case, her burning King's Landing is something that could potentially happen happen in the book, but as we discussed in her episode, the writers were unable to convey the growing instability within Danny that I feel is evident in the source material, which in turn, despite their incredibly forced and rushed portrayal of her downward mental spiral, makes her massacre in the show feel completely unearned and contradictory to the established character they penned. And it certainly didn't help that they also admitted a character who it is entirely possible and semi-probable will play a large role in sending Danny over the edge, but we'll discuss him in Varus' video. In Jamie's case, case, the theme of Cersei being his perpetual Achilles heel is evident in both the book and in the show. She'll be the end of you. Possibly. So Jamie eventually falling victim to this one weakness, or at least returning to Cersei for some reason resulting in his death, could be something that could potentially happen in the books. Seeing as Jamie's story is far from finished in the novels, and we don't know what circumstances will arise in his future. But Jamie returning to Cersei in the show makes absolutely no goddamn sense, and is contrived as balls. Now in our rewrite episode for Jamie, we gave a reasonable justification for Jamie returning to and dying by Cersei's side, but no such motivation exists in the show. Again, this character flip is egregious, but I guess, without condoning, I kind of see what the writers were trying to do, as is the case with Danny's situation as well. But as for Sandor, I don't even get what they were attempting to do. I understand they bowed to the pressure of Clegane Bowl hype, but even for the most hypest hypers of hype, such as myself, had we known the writers were only able to facilitate the brothers Clegane duking it out by making several nonsensical writing decisions and completely tarnishing an incredible character arc they had stuck to all the way up until halfway through the final season of the entire fucking show, yeah, I for one would have been chill with it laying on the cutting room floor. But alas, they just needed to fuck a colossal amount of shit up 
up in order to make a small, non-pertinent event like a game bowl happen just to appease dipshit trolling fanboys like me, I suppose in an effort to win some clout by delivering a steaming pile of fan service on a rusty tetanus infested platter, and yet in regard to the finale of Sandor's arc, the only thing it left us fans asking was, How do you fuck that up? How? Do you fuck that up? But we'll dive into that later on. Let's recap, shall we? Sandor Clegane, aka the Hound, begins our story as the personal bodyguard of then Prince Joffrey Baratheon. Jade with the concept of knighthood, Sandor has refused any offer to be knighted and instead works as a quasi mercenary, if you will. Sandor remains at Joffrey's side throughout the first season, taking on the role of protector and watchman of Sansa Stark, whom is to be betrothed to Joffrey. Even after Ned Stark's execution, Sandor remains to be sympathetic and protective of Sansa. Season 2 sees Sandor still under the command of now King Joffrey Baratheon, as well as continuing his protection of Sansa Stark, notably saving her from a gang of would-be rapists during the Riot of King's Landing. Sandor later dukes it out with the forces of Stannis Baratheon at the Battle of Blackwater, but upon seeing several Baratheon soldiers set ablaze, triggering his past trauma of when his older brother Gregor burned him, which resulted in his prominent facial scarring, Sandor flees his post. Sandor offers to bring Sansa with him away from King's Landing, but she refuses. Sandor then flees the city. We catch up with Sandor in Season 3, when he is kidnapped by the Brotherhood Without Banners and forced to face off against Beric Dondarrion in a trial by combat, which he is victorious in, much to the displeasure of Arya Stark, who has been traveling with the Brotherhood. Sandor is set free by the Brotherhood, but sticks around long enough to kidnap Arya Stark after she abandons them. Sandor then takes Arya as his quasi-prisoner and plans to ransom her to her brother Rob and mother Catelyn at the Twins, but unfortunately Sandor's payday is soured by perhaps the most epic party fail in history. Season Season 4 sees Sandor and Arya continuing their travels on their way to the Eyrie where Sandor plans to ransom Arya to her Aunt Lysa, but unfortunately his payday is spoiled once again due to a tragically unregulated skydiving accident. On their way back from the Eyrie, Sandor and Arya happen upon Brienne of Tarth and Podrick Payne. Brienne offers to protect Arya, but upon seeing that she is brandishing Lannister steel, Sandor assumes she is working for the Lannisters, which is technically true, but it's the gimpy one, so it's chill, and engages with her in combat. Sandor gets his ass whooped and is left hanging by a thread. Despite his pleas for Arya to put him out of his misery, Arya refuses and leaves the horribly injured Sandor to die a slow and painful death. And we're gonna stop right there, of course, seeing as we've come to the end of season four and... Oh shit, we can keep going? The, the, the showrunners didn't totally massacre Sandor's arc following this point? Oh shit, okay. All right, let's keep going. The next time we see Sandor is late in season six, where he has been nursed back to health by Septon Ray and has joined Ray's community, where Sandor seeks penance for his evil deeds of the past. Septon Ray believes that Sandor has been given a second chance and that there may be a greater purpose for him that he is yet to fulfill. When Ray and his followers are massacred by three men from the Brotherhood Without Banners, Sandor tracks two of them down and carries out swift and brutal justice. He eventually tracks down the third perpetrator, only to find him about to be lynched by Beric Dondarrion and Thoros of Mir. Sandor puts aside his vengeful rage and allows the Brotherhood to carry out the deed. Beric and Thoros then offer Sandor to join them on their journey to fight against the incoming White Walker threat. Season 7 sees Sandor traveling with the Brotherhood, and they eventually are recruited by Jon Snow to join the North in their fight against the Night King. Sandor then takes part in that thing that takes place beyond the wall late in Season 7, sorry my memory's a little hazy about it, and is present at the meeting with Cersei where she agrees to aid the North in their fight against the White Walkers. Or does she? Fuck you! You just got pranked! Season 8 sees Sandor arriving at Winterfell and preparing for the imminent attack by the Night King and his forces. Sandor fights valiantly in the battle, but the Northern forces are soon overrun and forced to retreat. Sandor continues to fight, but is left paralyzed due to his fear of fire. But upon seeing Arya, the girl he had developed a fondness for during their time together, almost overrun by a group of White Walkers, Sandor, in a masterful callback to his desire of the Lannister forces at the Battle of Blackwater, confronts his fear and continues to fight. And in the end, the Night King is defeated. And then Sandor remains at Winterfell, a new, honorable man who has long since dispelled the vengeful rage from within his heart that he has carried with him for his entire life. <laughs> episodes. That is how long it took to destroy the arc, the simple, picture-perfect arc of Sandor Clegane that they had built up over the course of eight 
fucking years. But we'll get into that later on after my Xanax is kicked in. Let's head back and talk about Sandor's character trajectory. Sandor's arc is one that is a staple in character writing, but that doesn't mean it is any less effective. We establish a character whom we are initially meant to see as grotesque and vile, and yet we slowly begin to see that they are more than meets the eye, and that there may be a spark of heroic potential within them. Oh, sorry, I've been using the wrong clips. Sorry, guys. In Sandor's case, this spark is demonstrated through his protective nature over those weaker than him, particularly the daughters of Lord Ned Stark, Sansa in seasons 1 and 2, and Arya in seasons 3 and 4. Though he tries to convince those around him, and probably mostly himself, that his guardianship over the likes of Sansa and Arya is driven solely by selfish motives, he is unable to conceal the compassion within him, as displayed when he faces off against Brienne of Tarth. Though Sandor probably would have just chalked up his defense of Arya as protecting his payday investment, it is palpable that he has grown to care for her and would protect her from harm no matter what. We as an audience are able to see that somewhere in Sandor, there is a good man. Sansa and Arya both completely changed their opinions of him after being with him for a period of time. But sadly, no matter how much good he does, does, the one person who will never be convinced that Sandor Clegane is a good man is Sandor Clegane. Sandor recollects every horrible deed that he has done in his past, and hell, he knows that he may have even enjoyed a great deal of it. But we as an audience can clearly see he feels remorse for his actions, and that remorse does not manifest itself by Sandor becoming a different person and making up for his past crimes by helping others in need, though that part of him seems to rear its head even without him trying, but rather by him drowning in his own self-hatred, which helps no one least of all himself. And this is what Septon Ray tries to get across to him after saving him from death. Sandor wallowing in his own self-pity helps no one and prevents him from leaving his old life behind so that he can go on to do good things. Septon Ray knows that as long as Sandor is unable to forgive himself, he is only a burden to the world. And season 6 and 7, we start to see Sandor slowly put aside his self-hatred and use the second chance he has been given to repent for the horrible deeds he committed in the past and to fight for something he truly believes believes in for the first time in his life. Beric later muses that perhaps the reason Sandor is alive is that there is a greater purpose for him, something that Sandor says he doesn't buy, but perhaps there is a small part of him that believes, or simply wants to believe, that Beric's words are true, and there is something else out there for him. And this belief of Sandor is what leads him to help the Northerners in their fight against the White Walker threat. And while we will discuss our ultimate plan for Sandor later in this episode, I just need to take a moment to point out that, as horribly depressing as this is, that the the reason Sandor's arc failed was not because the writers failed to give him a proper conclusion to his arc. They most certainly did. During the Battle of Winterfell, Sandor overcoming his fear of fire due to his instinct to protect Arya is the absolutely pitch-perfect ending of his arc. Sandor chose the path of the good man and acted as the guardian of Arya Stark, which in turn led to Arya being at Winterfell during the Night King's assault, and thus she was able to kill him, saving all of Westeros from a grisly fate. And that could have been the purpose that Sandor Sandor was meant to fulfill, to protect Arya so that she could make it to Winterfell to defeat the Night King. Sandor could have died right after saving Arya, or lived on after the battle as a changed man. It would have been perfect either way. You guys did it. It was done. It was over. Why did you have to tack on this ending for him that completely disregards and is wholly antithetical to the arc that you spent so much time building for him? You literally could just go back and edit out all of Sandor and Arya's scenes in King's Landing, and then throw throw in a quick scene after the Battle of Winterfell of Arya mourning the dead Sandor or having Sandor saying goodbye to Arya and leaving Winterfell in search of a new life. You edited out a fucking coffee cup, you twats. Why can't you edit this shit out? But alas, Sandor and Arya both decide to travel to King's Landing to kill Gregor and Cersei respectively, which doesn't make any sense since Danny's about to roll up and burn them to a crisp anyway, and why would Sandor still be so hellbent on revenge at this point that he is willing to undertake a potential suicide mission to murder his brother, who is basically pretty much just a walking zombie at this point in the story. And the answer to this question is something we've already discussed. The writers really, really, really wanted Clegane Bowl. Now, Clegane Bowl hype for the show has had a notable presence on the internet since 2013. So says the website that reigns as king of factual reporting, knowyourmeme.com. And why wouldn't it be? Who wouldn't want to see Sandor finally attain his revenge on his sick fuck of a brother? And Clegane Bowl hype wasn't restricted to just the show. As we discussed in Arya's episode, it is entirely possible and semi-probable that Clegane Bowl is going to, at some point, occur in the book series. But here's the problem. In Arya's video, we discussed one of the 
more likely theories as to how Clegane Bowl will occur. With Sandor having been saved by the Elder Brother and now a follower of the Faith of the Seven, that is if the Gravedigger theory is in fact true, which my scientific analysis based on absolutely nothing indicates that there is a 99.92% chance that it is, traveling the King's Landing to face off against Robert Strong, aka zombified Gregor Clegane, at Cersei's trial by combat following her Walk of Atonement at the end of A Dance with Dragons. So take note what is different between this scenario and the Clegane Bowl we get in the show. In the speculative book scenario, Sandor is fighting Gregor not for his own personal vengeance, but for his newfound faith. In the show, he seeks out and fights Gregor to quench his thirst for revenge. Forget that him doing so is completely antithetical to the point of his entire arc. The main reason Clegane Bolin was so disappointing was because it was grounded in hatefulness and rage. If Sandor had defeated Gregor and survived himself, what sort of character would he be after? He'd be nothing. He'd still be the same old Sandor wallowing in self-pity, whose only desire in life is to inflict pain on those who did him wrong. Here's a pro tip. Audiences don't want to root for characters like this. Is watching an asshole like Gregor Gez come up and satisfying? Of course it is. But that satisfaction is fleeting. It's like when you get absolutely blitzed on a Saturday night and thus your inhibitions are low enough for you to actually buy one of those godforsaken hot dogs they sell at 7-Eleven, which is delicious and amazing at the moment of consumption, but the only feeling you will feel during the following three hours on your toilet is shameful regret. The writers did not set up Clegane Bull for Sandor. They didn't work it in in a way that completely Sandor's quest for redemption. They did this to service the fans, but in doing so, they did a disservice to one of the show's most beloved characters. Here's another pro tip for you one day showrunners out there. Every author or writer or whatever wants to indulge in fan service at some point. They want to give their loyal audience a reward for sticking with them for so long. But the best way to do fan service to service your fans is to not just toss in a bunch of callbacks or needless hyped up confrontations. If you want to service your fans, serve service the characters first and foremost, the characters being the ones that made those fans stick around for so long. And the best way they could have honored Sandor and given his arc a fitting ending would have been to lay it to rest after the Battle of Winterfell, with his rescuing of Arya and overcoming his past trauma being the perfect climax for his story. Or they could have gone with the alternate scenario we discussed briefly in Arya's video. Have Arya head to King's Landing by herself to kill Cersei. Sandor then leaves Winterfell to stop her, as he does not want her to give her life for revenge. Arya heads to the Red Keep and is confronted by Gregor Clegane. Arya is about to be killed by Gregor when Sandor steps in and protects her. Sandor is able to defeat his brother, but not before being mortally wounded himself. With his dying breath, Sandor asks Arya to put aside her hate and rage and not seek her vengeance. Arya honors his dying request and returns home. Perhaps she even puts him out of his misery as she refused to do at the end of season 4. We have fan service with Clegane Bull, a nice callback with Arya performing a mercy kill on Sandor, and it is respectful to Sandor's inner journey. But of course, this is not what happens in our rewrite scenario, seeing as Arya ascends to the Red Keep, and it is seeing Cersei with her newborn daughter that snaps Arya out of her vengeful rage. So how does Sandor fit into our story? Well, we'll get to that, but let's briefly go back and smooth out some of the speed bumps in Sandor's arc throughout the entire show. Sandor's arc in the show for seasons 1 through 4 is, as with most characters, pretty damn solid. There are some differences. Sandor's burn injuries are far more severe in the book. The show doesn't really emphasize the quasi-romantic Beauty and the Beast-esque relationship between Sandor and Sansa. Sandor does not fight Brienne. Instead, Sandor and Arya stop at the Inn at the Crossroads after seeing the road to the Eyrie is closed, and Sandor faces off against some of his brother's men, a scene that was repurposed in the show and takes place in the first episode of season 4, which is where he is left hanged by a thread and Arya leaves him for dead. But most, if not all, of the changes made to Sandor's arc in the show are hardly detrimental and don't detract from his character's journey at all. In fact, some of the choices even enhance it. From the end of season 4 on, all of Sandor's material is original to the show, and as stated before, it is pretty solid and faithful to Sandor's arc. Except for... <laughs> Here's another pro tip. Maybe don't kick off your character's redemption arc where he repents for the misdeeds he committed against those who never did him any harm by having him mercilessly execute two innocent dudes right out of the gate. Like, who the fuck even are these guys? Why did they have to showcase Sandor fucking their shit up? Why not just have Sandor come across the same scene but only kill the two members of the Brotherhood and spare the two other guys? Or just write these two guys out completely and have him just come across the two Brotherhood bastards? Or just 
cut this scene out entirely and have Sandra come across Barrack and Thoros hanging all three of the killers instead of just Lem. A small hiccup with a small fix. Sandra's arc throughout season 7 is fine. The small arc with him returning to the home of the farmer and his daughter whom Sandor robbed back in season 4 and burying their bodies is great. I can't really recall what Sandor gets up to towards the end of season 7 so I'm gonna skip that. His shit talking Gregor in the dragon pit is dumb and completely out of character for him at this point in the series so we're gonna cut that. First half of season 8 is perfect with Sanders are culminating with him getting over his fear of fire and fighting to save Arya and then after this point is when I slip into the seventh circle of hell. Let's get into it. So in the show Sandor and Arya leave Winterfell together to kill their respective nemeses. Nem- nemesises. Ne- nem- nemesises. Nem- fuck. Now we've already discussed the numerous reasons as to why none of this makes any goddamn sense. But just as a quick recap, Sandor has moved on from his violent past, so there's no reason as to why he would still be so set on killing his brother. Arya at this point isn't a crazed killing machine, so why does she just need to be the one to kill Cersei? And both Cersei and Gregor are about to get torched as soon as Danny arrives at King's Landing, so why would either of them even bother? But in our rewrite, we see Arya fleeing Winterfell on her own to confront Cersei at King's Landing her vengeful psychosis blinding her from the fact that this will likely be a suicide mission. Revenge is all she has to live for, and without it, she is nothing. Upon learning that Arya has fled King's Landing, Sandor races after her, wishing to prevent her from making the same mistake that he has made and falling into a pit of hatred that will only end with her death. Now, as I mentioned in Jamie's video, I originally had Jamie and Euron facing off on the beach, as they do in the show, which is how Jamie becomes mortally wounded prior to meeting up with Cersei, which is essential for our rewrite scenario. But then then in Theon's video, I was like, nah, that fight was pretty dumb, so I cut it out. And Euron dies at the hands of Theon on the walls of King's Landing. So a problem needs to be solved. How does Jaime become mortally wounded prior to his meeting up with Cersei? I had a couple ideas in my head prior to writing Jaime's video. Perhaps he's attacked by someone on the streets of King's Landing before he reaches the Red Keep, or maybe Kyburn confronts him on the steps and shanks him before he gets to Cersei. But I think I have a better idea for this scenario. One I already sort of discussed earlier. One of our sample scenarios was that Arya is confronted by Gregor on her way to confront Cersei, which is where Sandor saves her. So let's use that. Our rewrite picks up with Jamie racing through the city to the Red Keep to get to Cersei and save their child. But as he reaches the Red Keep, he is confronted by Sir Gregor Clegane. The last time the mountain saw Jamie was when Jamie abandoned Cersei, and he does not appreciate that one goddamn bit. Jamie tries to make his way past, but Gregor draws on him. He and Jamie face off, Jamie doing his best to hold his own against the behemoth of a man, but it is soon obvious who will come out on top. Jamie is sliced across the chest by Gregor's massive greatsword, causing him to bleed profusely. Jamie hits the ground as Gregor raises his sword for the killing blow, and as he brings his sword down, we hear the clang of swords as Jamie looks up to find Sandor, his sword locked with his brothers. Sandor deflects Gregor's blow as he tells Jamie to go. Sandor distracts Gregor as Jamie, hugging his wound, dashes up the steps to the Red Keep. Meanwhile, Sandor and Gregor face off outside the Red Keep. Gregor is ferocious, his mindless rage evident with every swing. And though Sandor hates his brother to no end, there is only one thing on his mind. As Sandor fights off his brother, he calls out for Arya, wanting to know she is safe. The brothers continue their battle out in front of the Red Keep, Sandor begging with him, pleading with him to stop, hoping there is a sliver of human left within him. Sandor knows he cannot hold his brother off much longer, frantically looking around and calling for Arya, but to no avail. And just at that moment, as Gregor and Sandor part for just a moment, just as Gregor is about to strike again, a burst of flames comes raining down. A stray blaze of Drogon's fire breath during Danny's assault on King's Landing. And though the blaze misses Sandor, Gregor catches fire, and soon enough he is engulfed in flames. He falls to the ground in pain and agony. Sandor slowly approaches his brother, watching him burn, just as Gregor had done to him when they were children. And to make it even worse, Sandor sees that Gregor isn't dying anytime soon, his massive size and reanimation by Kyburn giving him near invincibility. Sandor must watch as his brother burns and suffers before his eyes. And and for a split second, we see joy in Sandor's eyes, a small smile forming on his face, finally seeing his brother burn for all the torment and trauma he has caused him, the vengeful part of Sandor rearing its head for just a moment. But then, Sandor's expression falls, watching Gregor burn without glee or pleasure, but pity. Watching a man burn, no matter who it is, is not something that the man Sandor has grown to be would do, and thus, 
Sandor makes his choice. With every fiber of strength he possesses, Sandor lifts Gregor's mighty greatsword, lifts it above his head, and brings it down on Gregor's neck, severing his head, and finally putting his brother out of his misery. Despite his hatred and resentment for his older brother, Sandor's final act is giving him the gift of mercy, truly showing just how much Sandor has changed over the course of the series. We then cut to Arya leaving the Red Keep with Cersei's child, as she makes her way through the hell that is King's Landing, as Danny continues her assault on the city. Arya makes her way through the burnt streets, littered with dead and dying, shielding Cersei's child from the horrors around them, and as they come to the end of the street, a stone building collapses beside her, rubble of the upper floor about to fall right down on top of Arya. Arya instinctively shields Cersei's daughter, but when she opens her eyes, she sees Sandor towering over her, shielding her from the rubble. Together, Sandor and Arya make their way through the city and to the outskirts, just as Danny's tirade comes to an end. Arya looks up at Sandor, realizing that he has come back for her, and Sandor is filled with relief, seeing that Arya is safe, and both of them oblivious to the fact that Sandor though indirectly, was the one who saved Arya and freed her from her vengeful rage. Because had he not saved Jaime, and Jaime had not made it to Cersei in time to help her through her birth, Arya would not have had the change of heart upon seeing Cersei's child. And thus, Sandor, once again, came to the Stark Girl's rescue. As Sandor, Arya, and baby Joanna stand there among the dead, Sandor relieved that Arya is okay, and Arya thankful that Sandor came back for her, Sandor asks Arya who the child belongs to, to which Arya just smiles as they make their way through the ruins of King's Landing. We later catch up with Sandor following Tyrion's trial and subsequent execution by Jon Snow. A tentative peace has come over the land, and Sandor, having helped the Northerners defeat the Night King and ensured the safety of Arya, Arya plans to leave King's Landing for parts unknown. That is, until both Arya and Sansa visit Sandor before he departs the city. Sansa and Arya both express their gratitude for everything he has done for them, for their people, for their home. But Sandor is still doubtful that he is a good man and worthy of their admiration. Despite all the good he has done, Sandor still feels there is no place or purpose for him in this world and simply must spend his remaining years in solitude. But Arya and Sansa, two people who once saw Sandor as an evil beast, and now see him for the man of honor he truly is, believe he still has a purpose in this world. And what is that purpose? Well, what has Sandor been doing for pretty much the entire series? He was the guardian for Sansa when she was at King's Landing, the protector of Arya Stark during seasons 3 and 4, and fight for the North in their war against the dead. Perhaps Sandor's purpose is to be the guardian, the savior of those in need, and thus, before Arya and Sansa return to Winterfell to rule the North, they ask him one final favor. As he has been the protector of two Starks already, they request he look after the two remaining Starks, King Jon Stark and Hannah of the King Bran Stark, as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Sandor is taken aback and moved by Arya and Sansa's request, but still doubtful that he is worthy of such an honor. But Arya and Sansa ensure him that he absolutely is. However, Sandor voices the only problem with their request. A Kingsguard must be a sworn knight. But Sandor, jaded with the concept of knighthood ever since he was a young man, has never taken said vows. And it is at that moment that Sir Brienne of Tarth enters the chamber. Brienne thanks Sandor for saving Jaime and the Jamie's daughter Joanna, as well as thanking him for his defense of Arya Stark that day on the road to the Eyrie. And then Brienne offers Sandor his knighthood, and Sandor, though still hesitant, accepts, as he takes a knee and is knighted by Brienne. Sandor stands and makes Brienne promise him that she will keep the Stark girl safe at Winterfell, to which she of course accepts. The last we see of Sandor is him donning the white cloak of the King's Guard and taking his place beside King John and Hand of the King Bran. Sandor Clegane, once thought to be nothing more than a brutal thug, now standing resplendent in his white cloak. And though he still holds reluctance that there is a chance at redemption for the concept of knighthood, as Lord Commander of the Kingsguard, he plans to see to it that the title of a knight will once again return to its former glory and respect. In the end, Sandor Clegane finally found his purpose. And thank you all for joining me today for this episode of Game of Thrones Rewrite, everybody. A bit shorter than my previous installments, I know, seeing as we already went over a good amount of Sandor's arc in Ari's video, but hopefully you found it to be faithful and respectful to the quality of the character. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode, consider supporting me on Patreon, and brace yourselves for our next episode, the one you've all been waiting for. Well, the time has come. 